soil health really is built on the backbone of soil organic matter, okay? So you probably hear a lot about soil organic matter and how important it is. Well, that's because it is. It has a tremendous impact on the physical qualities of soil, chemical qualities, and biological qualities. Um, just some of the major ones I'll point out here um, is enhancing soil structure, right? So what do we mean by soil structure? Well, that's the way the, s the soil peds fit together, right? And that's important because that dictates how much air and water movement can go through a particular soil. So that's really important for root growth and, and crop yields. Um, also, nutrient storage and release is a big one. And water flow um, is huge, right? So when we tend to have better soil structure, we have more pores in the soils that the air and water can move through. And that's, that's very critical from a, from a crop production and environmental standpoint, as we'll talk about. Okay, so <coughs> with that surface runoff, right? That's a, it's a big uh, deal right now, right? We've had a lot of rain. We see a lot of water coming off fields. Um, and this is, uh, this is erosion in action right there, right? So when we have these concentrated flows like this, we're losing sediment. But what else are we losing? We're losing phosphorus, right? So most of the phosphorus loss from our fields is driven by erosion and surface runoff, okay? So that's just something uh, to keep in mind here. So I don't want to bore you with the nitrogen cycle here, but again, some context, really important to keep uh, um, the idea of how complex the nitrogen cycle is, okay? Again, largely driven by weather, okay? So all these factors down here, soil drainage, fertility, right? How much nitrogen are we putting on? How much organic matter in the soil, manure rates, things like that. Um, and of course, um, cropping systems management, all these affect nitrogen cycling. A Couple things I wanna point out here though. So one of the major uh, loss mechanisms in our uh, fields is uh, volatilization of urea, so that's NH3, okay? So when um, urea can be quickly converted to this NH3, which is volatile to the atmosphere, so this turns out to be a huge loss of nitrogen from manure application and from fertilizer application, okay? So that's why incorporating um, is, a, is, is a big deal and conserves a lot of nitrogen, and, and we'll talk more about that. So the two plant available forms of nitrogen that you should be aware of are ammonium, so that's NH4 plus, and nitrate nitrogen, okay? So these two are both available to the crop. Um, ammonium nitrogen uh, is a little bit stickier. It can be held by soil exchange sites, whereas nitrate is very water soluble. And as soon as nitrogen is in this nitrate form, it can be washed, leached to tiles, leached to groundwater, uh, or just otherwise lost from the system. The other thing that can happen once we're in this nitrate form is this can be lost to the atmosphere, just like uh, ammonia can, right? So when oxygen becomes limiting in wet soils, uh, microbes start to go for the oxygen and nitrate to respire. And what happens is we lose um, nitrogen back to the atmosphere in one of these three forms, okay? Which uh, two of those are greenhouse gases, I'll just point out. Okay, so now we'll uh, zone in here a little bit more on manure and farms. Um, so just a little bit big picture on nitrogen, um, what we call mass balance. If, we, if you think about a farm of all the nitrogen sources coming in and those leaving the farm, okay? So the top graph, it's a ki kind of busy here, so I'll walk you through this. This comes from several large farms across the country, you can see here. So California, Idaho, large, small. I'm not gonna read them all, you can see. But if we look at the percentage of nitrogen exported from, from these farms, what do you notice up here? Well, what are the big ones? So ammonia, we just talked about, or environmental loss, right? So that's these green bars. So environmental losses would include uh, denitrification, volatilization, leaching, the things that we were just talking about on the nitrogen diagram, right? Um, but what are the other big exports? Well, milk and animals are pretty high, you know, somewhere around 40% or so on average. So that's good. Um, but those environmental losses are significant, right? When we're talking about more than 50% of our losses are coming from environmental losses. So that's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us to uh, improve our management and improve our bottom line by capturing more of that nitrogen, uh, particularly from manure application, which we'll be getting into here. 
So if you look at the bottom, that's just breaking out those environmental losses by the different uh, mechanisms. And again, a volatilization, that NH3 is huge, right? Uh, right across all those farms, we're losing a lot of nitrogen to ammonia loss, and that's pretty typical. Um, so, okay, so manure on hay forage crops. So there, in general, I think there's more manure uh, being applied to hay crop forages in general, and there may be some different reasons for that. Um, so one is fertilizer is not cheap, right? Uh, milk price is low. So the more we can use manure to meet our N, P, and K needs, the better, right? We're gonna cut down that fertilizer bill. That's not a bad thing. Um, some farms have a limited land base for manure application, okay? So that's another driver. Um, the other driver is environmental aspects like CAFO regulations, right? So if you have uh, highly uh, leachable soils or a lot of phosphorus in your soil, then that's going to limit the amount of manure that you can apply to your corn ground, for example, right? So that might in turn mean that more of your alfalfa and alfalfa grass stands are going to get uh, some, some more manure, okay? So where, when, and how? So I'll just go over this kind of quickly. So one of the things we want to think about is where can we use manure in the system, right? Where are there opportunities to get manure and get those nutrients uh, utilized by the crops we're growing? So where, so established stands uh, before new seedings, and then at stand termination is a typical place for manure, right? Whether it's a spring or fall seeding. So let's just go with the established stand, right? So when do we wanna apply to an established stand? Well, as soon as possible, right? So the second you get that hay harvested, the, the quicker you can get that manure on, the better, right? So once the regrowth starts, you're gonna, you're gonna start having higher risk for um, damage and yield loss, particularly with alfalfa, right? Alfalfa does not like to be driven on. Uh, the crowns are very sensitive, okay? Um, so as soon as possible, and then how? Well, typical way is to broadcast, right? Uh, but injection is better, and I'll, I'll share some data with you on that. Uh, new seedings, spring or summer, as I mentioned. Um, you know, how? Inject, incorporate, uh, moderate rates. So uh, we want to, you know, we don't want to be putting 10, 15,000 gallons of liquid manure on uh, before a seeding. That's a little high, right? So your salt could, salt index is high, um, things like that. It's just too high. So you want to think about moderate rates there. And then stand termination. Now, typically, this has been the place where we just put lots of manure on. It's like, oh, we're going to hit that. We're going to spray it with Roundup, and it's going to corn next year. We're going to put lots of manure on there. Turns out that's not the best idea because, right, when we kill a sod or an alfalfa stand, we get a lot of nitrogen release in that next year or even in that fall, depending on the weather. So if you add manure on top of that, you're really um, overwhelming the system with nitrogen. And so you're going to lose a lot of that over the, over the winter. And so it's not really a good idea to put a lot of manure on before you terminate a stand. Okay, so just keep that in mind. So what about manure on uh, established hay? So these are my top, top five here. So as we just mentioned, apply as soon as possible, right? Avoid compaction. That's a big one, particularly for alfalfa, but also grass, right? So if the soil's wet, stay off of it, right? If you can, so that's a huge one. Um, focus on grass alfalfa. So what do I mean by grass alfalfa? Well, if the content of grass is greater than 60%, we tend to see a, a greater response from manure in terms of nitrogen, okay? So <clears throat> not that you can't put manure on an alfalfa stand, but we tend to see better results when there's some component of grass in the mix. Um, now, if we can inject or incorporate, uh, I think that's a good thing. We capture a lot more of that ammonia nitrogen and we have uh, more phosphorus uh, remaining in the soil and less subject to runoff, so that's good. And then again, uh, moderate rates on hay fields, right, um, for the most part. Maybe a heavy grass sand, we can go a little bit above 5,000 5, gallons an acre, assuming something else isn't limiting. So just a little bit on manure nutrient content, okay? One thing I want to point out is just how variable manure nutrient content is. So you probably hear people like me say, don't just use a book value for NPK of manure, and this is why. So look at the range, this, this, these data come from University of Wisconsin over 1998 to 2010. 
Um, and so just I want you to focus on the dairy liquid here. Uh, so NPK going down. Um, and look at the range. One to 125 pounds per thousand gallons of total nitrogen. That's a really big range, right? Um, and the same goes for P and K. So I'm not, I don't want to belabor the point. I just want to, the take home message here is that if you're working with an agronomist or if you're not on your cropping, you really need to test that manure at least once a year. So then you know what you have and you can feel confident at delivering um, those, those precise or more precise N, P, and K rates for crops, okay? Okay, so now we'll get into uh, a little bit more of the manure application specifics. So probably you uh, all are familiar with these. Um, surface broadcast, the golden standard, if you will. Um, here, some sort of tillage incorporation. Uh, this, this guy happens to be hooked up to a drag hose, but um, basically this is a, a disc incorporator, okay? Um, here we have sh shallow uh, disc incorporation and then uh, banding with an aerator. Okay, so these are these two on the right here are two methods that we've been working with over the past few years up at the Marshfield Ag Station. So here's just a kind of a cross-section view of some of these different tools. Um, here's a sleigh foot or a traveling shoe here. That would be this or a, a chisel type um, injector. Okay, so obviously if you're a no-till farm, you would not want to use this, right? Um, so here's a shallow disc injector, aerator, and uh, the chisel and the sweep, okay? Okay, so real quick, these, uh, this information's coming from Cornell University, but if you look across different land-grant recommendations, you'll, you'll see this uh, general relationship. So what we have here is uh, the relationship between percent ammonia loss, right, that NH3, versus days until incorporation, okay? And what you can see is this uh, logarithmic increase right, in loss with time. So basically, if we apply manure broadcast, right, we don't incorporate it, we just leave it on the surface, we're going to lose about 70% of that ammonia N in that manure after just a week, okay, if we don't do anything, if it doesn't rain or anything, okay. If it rains, we're going to get some of that, right. But this is just to show you, you know, it's a pretty fast reaction. We lose ammonia really quickly. So the quicker we can get that incorporated via tillage or injected, um, we're going to save a lot of that nitrogen. Okay, a little bit on the costs here. Um, so the top table here is just looking at initial costs for the equipment. Um, and these are averages, of course, so take it with a grain of salt. Um, but let's focus on the large, large and small dairy here. So here we have broadcast no-till, so we're just broadcasting. Um, broadcast with tillage incorporation, aerator banding, and shallow disc injector. So you can see the, uh, the price to, get to buy the, that equipment, right? So obviously, um, you know, this, the um, injection equipment is more expensive, right? Uh, that's not a surprise. Um, so if we look at this on a income and net return basis, so this is using a partial budget and trying to incorporate the, the added benefit of keeping some of that ammonia nitrogen, okay, by incorporating. What you'll notice is, and this is in US dollars per cow across the bottom, so here are your four treatments across the bottom. Now, I don't know about you, but those bars look pretty similar to me across these different incorporation methods. So if we believe these numbers, we can, we can say that there's just not a lot of um, economic differences between these four methods, okay, based on these numbers. Okay, so just a little bit more on the ammonia end loss by, by a different method here. And this, these percentages are relative to that surface application, okay? Um, so I don't want to belabor the point here, but in general, let's focus on the forage here because we're going to talk more about forage. Um, so if we look at that uh, aerator banding, so 33% less ammonia end loss. Um, in disc injection, we do a little bit better, 20 to 75% less ammonia loss. Um, so again, proving that point that the, the quicker we can get that incorporated, the better off. Now here's some work from my predecessor, Bill Jokola, who's done quite a bit of work on different uh, low disturbance and manure incorporation techniques over the years. Um, and so this orange line here, this is the broadcast surface, 
right? So this is in pounds per acre of nitrogen. And this is going for about uh, two days here, so 48 hours after manure application. So you can see that we lost, let's see, about 14 pounds of ammonia nitrogen in just two days. And I should say, this was in the fall, right? This is November, uh, pretty cool temperatures, right? And it even rained. But we still lost 14 pounds of N with that surface broadcast application in just two days. So it's quite rapid, even in cool uh, conditions. Uh, and you can see the other treatments, how they fall out here, but, but long and short, the strip till inject and the coulter or the shallow disc injector were much, much more effective at capturing that ammonia nitrogen. Okay, so here's the same data looking at what the corn yields did, and I think this is kind of interesting here. So the best results in terms of yield, this is dry matter tons per acre, was that sweep inject. Um, and then going, going down here to the broadcast, so basically the no nitrogen control yield and the broadcast manure were no statistically similar in yield. There's no difference. So what does that say? So all that manure that we broadcast on the surface, I mean, in terms of yield, it didn't do anything, right? So we might as well not even have spread the manure if we believe these numbers, right? So no difference in, in yield. So it really goes to show you that if we can capture some fraction of that ammonia nitrogen, uh, we're going we're gonna to have a better yield potential uh, at the end of the day. So uh, Bill also looked at phosphorus runoff losses as part of this, part of this work. This was simulated rainfall on field plots, okay? And what do you see here? So biggest losses with that surface broadcast, no surprise. About half the phosphorus was particulate P, which is phosphorus bound to soil particles. Remember I said erosion, right? And then the other half was soluble reactive or dissolved DRP, d uh, dissolved reactive phosphorus. And that's phosphorus that's bioavailable. So crops can take it up. It also fuels algae, okay? So the water quality people get pretty excited about this DRP number here. So if they were to look at something like this, they would say, wow, we, you know, the water quality is a lot better when we inject that manure, right? It's, 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 in fact, there's no statistical difference in phosphorus loss between the strip till and the, treat and the plots that got no manure, which is encouraging, I think, uh, from, a, from a production standpoint. Okay, so I'll t a few slides here on some of the recent work that we've been doing up at Marshfield, and uh, my technician, Jessica Sherman, has been uh, leading the way on that for the past couple years. Um, so why do we care about low disturbance uh, application besides the fact that we can save nitrogen? Well, low disturbance is important in no-till settings and for forage stands, right? We don't want to uh, beat up our forage stands when we apply manure um, and take a big yield hit, right? Just to just have a better um, environmental outcome, right? We got we to be thinking about the yield and economics at the same time. So. This is just to show you that these low disturbance method compared to some of the traditional ways of applying manure, such as tillage incorporation, right? We really do uh, have a lot less disturbance with the low uh, disturbance methods. So uh, let's see, see a good example here with the disc injection here, shallow disc. So 83 to 89% of the small grain stubble was still there after manure application. So that's pretty good. So it's not disturbing the soil and leaving that residue um, or live crop as it, as it may be intact for the most part. So here's some, uh, this is kind of busy, so I apologize, but uh, here's some work that we've done, uh, or Jess has done over the past couple years. And I just want to point out here, so um, the yellow is the percent manure coverage. So this, these were taken, each plot was taken a picture, a picture was taken with a camera, and then you have this uh, tricky software that can tell you what proportion of the image is covered by live vegetation versus manure versus soil, okay? So you can see seven different rainfall simulation events on this alfalfa grass uh, plots. And so the thing to note is other than right after manure application, we didn't really see a lot of differences in terms of the live crop. So if you just look at the green bars, that's the percentage of live crop. So at the end of the day, there were no statistical differences between 
the percentage of live crop between these different methods, which suggests to us that the yield loss or yield potential would be also similar across these different methods, okay? So that's good news. So a quick look at the, at the water quality runoff here. Um, and this is the average water quality concentrations over these seven events. So real quick, the red bars are the control, so no manure on the red bars. Green was the surface broadcast. Uh, band has the stripes, okay? Aerator plus band is the orange. And the shallow disc injection is the blue. So long and short, the shallow disc inject injection system seemed to, to do the best in terms of reducing phosphorus runoff. Um, and concentration. So this is just the concentration of, of um, nutrient. This is not the load, but the loads or the amount that came off each plot pretty much followed the same trend as these concentrations, okay? So what's interesting to note here again is that shallow inject was basically significantly lower than the other three treatments and was very similar to the control that had no manure. Okay, so that's good news. We can get the benefit of the manure, but not get the, the negative uh, sort of uh, effect when it rains, right? So if we can capture that manure, keep it protected, keep the nitrogen in the ground, um, and by at the same time keep that phosphorus less vulnerable to surface runoff, that's a good thing. So as you all know, uh, the manure application equipment is rapidly evolving. Maybe that's why some of you are here not just for the manure equipment, right, but to, to get the latest and greatest on all the farm equipment. Um, and so I'm still getting up to speed on it myself. So just keep that in mind. I'm sure hopefully you've, you've uh, gotten to look at some of that equipment today. Um, so here it's another uh, shallow disc incorporator or injector, excuse me. And this is a particular version can go around corners. So one of the issues with these is you have to pretty much drive straight. Well, now they have these units that you can just keep in the ground and you can make those turns and, right, you can hook up to GPS so you can have variable rate manure application based on your soil fertility. And that's kind of where things are going, at least uh, on larger scale farms. Okay, what do you guys think about side dressing manure for corn, right? Yeah. How logistically complicated, right? But it seems like a good idea, right? We have a lot of manure. Uh, we generally have more than we can utilize, right? So if we can figure out a way to utilize that liquid manure in our, in our corn ground, right? That, what a great benefit, at least agronomically, hypothetically, right? If we could use that nitrogen to a growing corn crop. Um, makes sense to me anyway. So. Anyway, there are some farmers that are trying this and having some success with it. Um, in fact, a recently published study out of Minnesota um, showed that summer fertigation with liquid dairy manure increased manure nitrogen use efficiency by a whopping 127% over the control. Now, that's pretty amazing to me. Um, again, that's it might not be logistically feasible in every system, but it's something to think about. So one of my cousins uh, has a big dairy farm down in central New York, Finger Lakes region. And he's, over the years, developed this, what he calls the nutrient boom. And this is a piece of equipment that works um, in tandem with a, a drag hose. And it <clears throat> basically, it's an automated manure application system. So you set this thing up, and you can more or less walk away. But not, it's not quite to that level yet. But the idea is it has these long drop hose, and you can side dress manure in a standing corn crop up until seven feet canopy height. So that's pretty, pretty amazing. So they got some money a couple years ago to work with Cornell University to, to uh, do some field trials with this. And that's what I'm going to share with you here. So on the left here, uh, we have the corn grain yield and then uh, a fertilizer application rate. So they also did a full end rate study with this, which is kind of cool. So what do you see here? Well, the plots that didn't get any manure, right, we see that typical yield response curve with added nitrogen, right? So as we increase our nitrogen, right, our yield goes up and flattens out. Well, we've all seen that. But look at the manure plots. No yield response to the added nitrogen where, where that manure was side-dressed, right?
And in fact, what they found was the manure, manure plots uh, significantly yielded significantly more than the fertilizer only plots. So the corn crop was getting more than just nitrogen, right? It uh, could have been some of the water, micronutrients, PK. So it's kind of like the manure priming effect, if you will, right? We get, we get a yield bump uh, from adding manure, and it's not just from one particular element. It's from multiple, uh, multiple factors, okay? So here on the right, just kind of breaking it out by uh, corn hybrid. Um, and uh, again, you can see that same, same trend, right? The, in 2017, um, no yield response for those manure. So this is encouraging. I think uh, if we could you know, handle the logistical part, I think side dressing makes sense for corn if we, could, if we can make that happen. Okay, so weighing your options here, we're gonna wrap up here. Uh, there's a lot of things to consider when we're talking about manure management, right? Uh, a lot of factors to consider, economic, environmental, and otherwise logistic, neighbor relations, odor. So the point is, um, it's not an easy decision. So you want to you wanna, you know, work with your crop advisor, work with your consultants, and uh, really push the pencil on this. Really push the pencil. And, um, and really, I'd encourage you to think about injection. And if you're not incorporating and you are a conventional tillage system, to really think about ways that you might be able to get more bang for your buck for your, for your manure. So summing up, uh, compared to broadcast, surface broadcast, low disturbance application, well, we have a lot uh, greater ability to capture that ammonia, as I hope I've, I've gotten across, up to 90% in some cases. We maintain that residue, or our forage crop, if we're injecting in a forage system. We have reduced phosphorus runoff losses, uh, similar yield potential, we think, so far, greater nutrient use efficiency, um, and while it may take a longer time to inject, um, the, the net return is similar, okay? So that's something to think about. Um, and then the final point I, I'll make is that manure management, we talked a lot about manure management in the last 45 minutes, but it's just one part of the system, right? Our ag systems are systems, right? They're interrelated. There's a lot of factors going on. And so things like whether we're using cover crops or not, our soil fertility program, you know, our soil types, all those things have a major impact. So this is just one piece of the puzzle um, to think about. And with that, I'm happy to take your questions and thanks for your attention. Hope I didn't scare you all away. Yeah, in that situation, it would be, uh, we're talking specifically about ammonia. And ammonia, once it's in ammonia form, it's, it's complete. Sorry about that. Thanks, Mike. Um, the ammonia is volatile. So it will, um, once, so it could be in the ammonium form, which is NH4+. Plus, but once it gets converted to ammonia, it's, it's volatile. So if it's near the surface, it's going to go right to the atmosphere. Oh, good question. So his question is, does the nitrogen that volatilizes from ammonia loss, does it get, um, does it come back down in precipitation? And the answer is yes. S uh, uh, some of it does. Yep. So depending on where you are in the country, you, we can get as much as 10 to 20 pounds per acre per year just from rainfall. Just from rainfall. Nitrogen. Absolutely. Yep. But that's not to say that all the... Uh, ammonia and that's lost from our fertilizer and manure applications comes back down in the form of rain, but certainly s some fraction of it uh, does. That's actually a really good question. The other thing to note is there has been research that's looked at how far the ammonia travels from manure applications, and in, in many cases that ammonia doesn't travel too far off-site, so it will it'll volatilize up, but it will be carried and then redeposited in more regionally or locally as well. So that, that type of thing can happen too. Mike. So C3 versus C4, that's a good question. So I, that's a really good question. I don't have a lot of experience with the C4s. Um, 
So my, my general sense is that I, I, don't, I wouldn't see a lot of differences in the, in the nitrogen dynamics between cool season grasses and, and um, warm season. Other than obviously the cutting cycle is, is a lot different. Warm season, you'd, you'd only maybe get one or two harvests. Um, so from that standpoint, I think cool season grasses would be more nitrogen efficient because we get more cuttings and we can apply more nitrogen. But yeah, that's a good question. No other takers? You're all experts now? Well, thanks, thanks for coming, yeah. So the question is the airway bar is not that effective. Well, um, in our study it was. It was pretty close um, to the shallow disc injector. Not quite as good for phosphorus and nitrogen, but it was definitely better than, um, absolutely, way better than surface, yep. And, and fairly, fairly, at least in the range uh, of the shallow disc injector. Yep. So I, th I think that's a good option. The one thing you have to be careful with those if you, if you use, well, compaction is always an issue, but I, I've read enough studies to know that with the aerator, if you use, use it when the s there's too much moisture in the soil, you can actually increase surface runoff and not right. So some cases, you, it, you know, the idea was that that would help infiltration into the soil, but if you don't use it at the right time, you, it can actually increase uh, surface runoff, right, in a, like a clay soil or something like that. So you got to be careful. All right, thanks, everybody.